Hello everyone and welcome to the first part of chapter 8 on the training beyond stream entry in the context of the lecture series True Dhamma following in the footsteps of the Buddha. My name is Dr. Florian Lau from the Dhamma Hub and today we start with a very essential training of one who is in training, as the Buddha put it, of any noble disciple who has already attained the right view and with it stream entry, the first stage of awakening. But first of all, as always, a short overview over the content of this lecture. And this time around, we start with a story about the Buddha's awakening and analyze that in a bit more detail. Then we have another story time that is approaching the end of the life and teaching career of the Buddha. Then we have a bit of a recap when it comes to the different stages of uh, awakening and the different uh, trainings that we have to undergo and then we highlight what must be done now namely overcoming sensuality and the taints as a buddha put it and uh, then we have a bit more content on the possibility of both overshooting the mark and undershooting the mark in different ways then we try to understand what nibbana even means and then we have a look at the various different paths that might bring us closer to nibbana and in the end, as always, we have a short summary that uh, gives us a concise overview over all the very important points of this chapter for those uh, that want to really learn what matters. But now to our five minutes of mindfulness meditation, as always, try to meditate for five minutes now and weaken your craving, weaken your tendency of greed, aversion and delusion so that you can better profit from the content in this video. Because it can happen that Dhamma can be a bit unpleasant at first because, as the Buddha put it, it goes against the grain of the world and the more immersed in instant gratification and pleasant feelings you are, the more unwelcome can Dhamma seem. So this is also the reason why we always need some kind of divine messenger event that gets us into Dhamma because it does not appeal in the beginning. It is the ultimate solution and offers the ultimate happiness, but it comes at a price of work that you have to put into it. But yeah, sit down for five minutes, pause the video if you wish, I will not pause it here, and try to resist all the urges that are based on greed, aversion and delusion for a while, and then stay like that until your mind becomes calm and malleable, as the Buddha put it. I will now shortly pause, and then we continue as I assume you are done now. Okay, but first of all, we want to analyze a bit more, more in detail the Buddha's awakening. So what did the Buddha do? Why is the Buddha special or why is any Buddha special? Which is something that should be answered in my opinion. If we do not understand why awakening is hard, then it's very likely that what we might be attaining or might be working towards is not the real awakening that the Buddha talked about. Because he always said that it is a very hard thing to do. Not only that, he was very vocal about the fact that it, that it is probably the hardest thing that you can ever do. So it is most difficult, but also most rewarding. And the Buddha was special in the sense that he discovered the Dhamma, the teaching that leads us to Nibbana, on his own, without any help. And he pretty much discovered something that was invisible. And he removed obstructions of the mind by indirection, via dependent origination. And this is very important. And we discuss that in detail in chapter six. And he also noticed, and this is also very important, that not all pleasures are bad, as an example. People usually have the tendency to jump to one or of two extremes, namely shunning all pleasures or completely indulging in pleasure. Those are more or less the two opposite poles that people radiate towards. And the Buddha discovered that there are some pleasures that are leading us closer to liberation. And those pleasures are completely fine to experience. In the beginning, he shunned them and he did not want to experience any kind of pleasure. But this is on the level of the Bodhisattva before the awakening of the Buddha. So this kind of training was not leading him to liberation and he noticed that at some point because he was practicing some form of extreme asceticism which nearly killed him before he attained uh, liberation of mind. And the chances of any person discovering the way out of this are very, very small because our biological programming, so to speak, forces us into one of those two extremes and going against that requires a lot of insight and a lot of training that is very hard to come by and the chances for anyone to discover that are incredibly slim because you must do something that is so counterintuitive for such a long time without showing without it showing any results that it is basically impossible for anyone to just stumble upon that 
And the chances again of that are so incredibly slim <laughs> that it's uh, bordering the impossible. And people who understand that and understand the difficulty of this, understand the Dhamma and the teachings of the Buddha as very likely the greatest treasure in existence. But yeah, and shortly after the uh, awakening of the Buddha, he was very much not inclined to teach because he understood very well how difficult it was, how difficult it was to attain this and how much it goes against our natural inclination of mind. And he was very aware of the fact that very few people would be able to receive his teachings well, especially in the beginning when he had no reputation as an example. But uh, as the story goes, a certain Brahma god convinced the Buddha that it might be a good idea to teach the Dhamma nonetheless, as the Buddha had the capability to teach. He was a very smart person. He was pretty much a spiritual genius and a genius at teaching. So as the Dhamma goes against the stream or grain of the world, he still decided to teach it. And yeah, he also noticed that the Dhamma is very subtle and beyond mere reasoning, which is also a very important part. But in the end, he decided out of compassion to nonetheless teach. And he noticed that there are people with little dust on their eyes, and it would be good to teach them because they would be lost otherwise, even though they fulfill basically all the preconditions to actually make it to, to stream entry or even to, to final nibbana. And thus, this is pretty much the only reason that the teachings still exist today, because uh, Brahma Samapati, I think that was his name, uh, convinced the Buddha to, to teach. Otherwise, it would be, would be likely that the Buddha would have remained a private Buddha, because it is troublesome, it is bothersome. To, to teach when people actively go against that and people do not actually value that and don't really want to, to follow what you teach. But again, in the end, he decided to teach out of compassion. And this is the reason why we have the teachings today. But yeah, the, there is also a, a myth or a story uh, as it goes after the liberation of the Buddha. And it is said that Mara, the evil one, the tempter, <laughs> still followed the Buddha around for seven years and presented him with sensual prospects so those things will not go away. But as your mind is so trained and so lofty and so above sensuality, you do not suffer from it and you don't have to, to give it. And it is pretty much like a raven that is thinking that it found a lump of fat, but after a while it realizes that it is just a stone and then it loses interest. And in the same way, Mara has lost interest in the Blessed One after he realized, okay, there is nothing I can do to gain access to the mind of the Buddha. So I cannot in any way lead the Buddha back to the world of the senses. And yeah, the Buddha was pretty much unbothered, but still presented with those sensual prospects. So the sensual prospects, they stay in the world, which is very important. The Buddha often said that the beautiful things in the world remain standing even for an arahant. It is just that they have no longer any pull on you. This is the important difference. This is why the arahant's mind is completely free. Not because he avoids the circumstances that make him fall back towards sensuality, that make him make another one fall back to suffering. He is liberated because regardless of the circumstances, he cannot fall back because his mind is fully liberated. And now we come to the story time of the day. And this time around, we are closing in on the last year of the Buddha's teaching and the teachings of his chief disciples. And in the last year, both of the chief disciples of the Buddhas died. First, uh, 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 Sariputta died. He died 14 days apart of Mahamogalana. And he simply died to, uh, to a grave illness. He was afflicted, suffering and gravely ill, and died at the age of uh, 84. So he was four years older than the Buddha. The same is, by the way, true for Mahamogalana. And he had attained final Nibbana, and a novice named Kunda brought the Buddha his robe and bowl and informed him of the death of, of Sariputta. And Ananda, the personal attendant of the Buddha, who was only a stream enterer at the time, was absolutely devastated by that because uh, Sariputta was such a gain for the Sangha, for the noble Sangha of the Buddha, because he helped so many people attain either stream entry, the right view, or final Nibbana. He was providing the Sangha with robes and had a very good reputation, and in general, the Buddha said he was a general of the Dhamma, second only to the Buddha. So when he died, it was regarded as a grave loss by uh, people who have not yet made the full breakthrough to the Dhamma, which is also very important. And the Buddha remained uh, reminded Ananda of the work he still had to be uh, had had to be doing because he was not yet full uh, finished and he was still suffering. 
the loss of such a person as Sariputta. And he advised Ananda that each must make himself an island which is unreachable by any kind of suffering. And then, uh, 14 days later, the death of Mahamogalana also occurred. He was also 48 uh, years and he died under different circumstances. The Jains, a competing sect of wandering ascetics, hired an assassin to pretty much kill Mahamogalana as he was uh, giving a lot of discourses that uh, put down the teachings of the Jains and uh, exposed them as wrong. And they are still wrong nowadays, by the way. <laughs> they are still uh, not leading to the liberation, at least that the Buddha described, but they were claiming that they would. And thus, uh, Mahamogalana decided to talk against that and to inform people of the wrongness of those teachings. But then the, the assassin <laughs> pretty much found Mahamogalana after a few attempts and tried to beat him to death. This is, by the way, why Mahamogalana, when he is displayed on any kind of statue, is always displayed as blue because he was pretty much beaten blue and black by the assassin. But due to the strong supernatural powers that Mahamogalana uh, possessed, he was able to regain consciousness and supposedly died in the Buddha's presence. And uh, it is said that a lot of that is due to bad karma that he made in his past life. And this is why assassins were hired to kill him, because he instigated the deaths of his parents in the past life. He did not kill them, because that would <laughs> immediately lead to a rebirth in hell, but he instigated the death. And he had to bear the burden of that karma that he had created in the past, which is also important to keep in mind. So you cannot escape your past choices. They will come back and haunt you. You will reap what you sow, as other uh, religious traditions say. And now we come to the training beyond stream entry, or what must still be done by a person who has attained the right view and technically knows the way out of suffering. From that moment onwards, you technically do not need a teacher anymore, because you know what must be done on a very general level, but you can still very much benefit from a teacher. The Buddha was still speeding up the progress of people who had attained the right view, and that was still very beneficial, because it can take you up to seven lifetimes uh, to make it to final Nibbana after attaining the right view. And with the instructions of the Buddha, the entire process can go a lot, lot faster. Okay, let us begin. But now to a gentle reminder of what must be done at each of those stages and the structure of the teachings of the Buddha. When the Buddha spoke to people, when he gave them lectures, about 80% of those lectures or suttas are spoken to people who had already attained the right view or stream entry. And the sole reason for those discourses was to speed up their progress towards final Nibbana. And many things and many knowledge and much training in virtue and all kinds of other things concerning the gradual training were presupposed. Those people already fulfilled those preconditions. Those were very advanced monks and monks kinda have made it their life goal to escape suffering. So that is their job. They invest a lot of time in that. So their preconditions are a lot better than those of modern practitioners who just practice at home most of the time. So the value of those suttas have to be seen in that light. And most of what follows is of limited value for beginners in this entire chapter. This is also important to keep in mind. Most of the beginners striving until someone has attained the right view should be focused on chapter 5, 6 and 7. When you have gained the right view, then you can come back here and look for further instructions. It can also be beneficial to, before that, uh, try to measure the task, as the Buddha put it, to find out what must be done. But until then, you should frequently, uh, frequently subject yourself to interrogations by Sotapanna, a noble discussion with other people who are also striving towards Nibbana, if they are at least Sotapanna or higher, and thus knowing what they are talking about. And if those are not available, then you can use the presented self-interrogations of the past lectures and uh, combine them with a lot of self-honesty to make progress without such a teacher. And if you need suttas for beginners, as an example, you can easily search them online. For example, the Rahula Sutta is always something that I'm advising, but there are many suttas that are even more suitable for beginners. Because the Rahula Sutta, even if it was spoken to the 11-year-old son of the Buddha, is kind of advanced. Many people cannot really practice like that. But yeah, anyway, let us continue. Just to give you an idea, most of the suttas are of limited value to you, but that does not mean that you should not try to practice what is in there. It just means that it not yet applies. It is still good to make an effort and to try to understand them. 
Okay, but now a short reminder of what must be done at the Petujana stage. The Petujana stage is the stage until you have the first experience of dependent origination, as in you have broken the, the chain of dependent origination at exactly one link. And the goal at that level is a direct experience of Anicca, a very direct seeing of Anicca in your experience. And thus you want to break free of your prior distorted perception. You want to notice that that which you thought comes first actually comes second, namely yourself. Your sense of control comes second. First the world changes and then your sense of volition comes into play, but it comes after and the mind rationalizes that away. And thus you break the link of dependent origination at exactly one spot or the chain at exactly one spot. And as a result, you pretty much attain the right view, even if you have not yet fully understood the relationship between ignorance and suffering, which would be stream entry as the Buddha explained it, or as I understand it. But from that moment onwards, you have pretty much a guarantee that you attain stream entry in this very life, because such an experience cannot be forgotten. It completely inverts your entire mode of perception, let's put it like that. But to actually make it that far, you must actually cultivate a lot of disenchantment with sensuality through, for example, a divine messenger event, great trauma, lots of disgust with uh, life or things like that, death contemplation or things like that. It also requires a lot of sense restraint because otherwise there is no disenchantment. You only notice the, the perilous nature of the human existence when you actually stop acting out of craving. And uh, the most gross kind of stopping to act out of craving would be to keep the five precepts unconditionally, to keep them forever. That limits the damage that you can do. And again, the Buddha said that keeping the precepts is what distinguishes humans from animals. And it also requires you to cultivate peripheral, peripheral awareness. You must see things in the background of your experience. You must at least see two things at once for understanding dependent origination. And you need womb attention. You must understand how those things influence each other, each other. You must see directly how one thing completely determines another thing. And that requires you to see two things at once. And that requires you to have that reflexive component in your awareness. You have to have mindfulness, strong mindfulness, because that mindfulness allows you to do two things at once. One thing that you attend to and one thing that you know is going on in the background, as an example. And this is called womb attention because one part of your experience is like giving birth to another part of your experience. That is a good way of putting it. And without that, you cannot possibly have a breakthrough to the Dhamma. This is why the absorption techniques are so wrong when it comes to insight, because they focus in on one object and one object only, but you need at least two to ever understand dependent origination. If you do not train yourself in that way, you cannot make a breakthrough to the Dhamma. And it also requires you, the entire right view business requires you, the ability from you the ability to let bad feelings endure in the mind. Because when you do not do that and always act out of bad feeling and make it go away, then you can never inspect the components of your experience that must be inspected, namely feelings and craving. Remember, the Buddha was talking a lot about craving. And if you always make the craving go away immediately, then you cannot inspect it. And without that, you cannot understand it. And it also requires overall an effort at understanding and utterances of another. Utterances of another means that you require instruction to end up at the right view, because you would never come up with the idea of looking in that direction where you must look at without the instruction of another, because it completely goes against our natural inclination, against our natural mode of being, which is very important to keep in mind. And those are more or less the preconditions that the Buddha named when it comes to attaining the right view. And then we have the face follower or the Dhamma follower stage. And the Dhamma follower or the face follower has broken the chain of dependent origination at, at, at exactly one link, which has led to the aforementioned inversion of your perception and experience. So now you notice that that which comes first was actually coming second, etc. So the order of perception is reversed now and you see yourself as coming second and the entire world pretty much of the senses arising first. And you can from now on see the three marks of existence uh, directly and you can remember them pretty much. So you have access to that forever by now. You can just ignore that for a limited amount of time. And it is technically a noble person. You are technically a noble person now if you have attained that. But there is no, not yet the fruit of that attainment, namely the complete freedom from suffering at will pretty much. 
you still have removed pretty much all suffering or the vast majority of suffering already, but there is still more suffering than for a than for a stream enderer. Let's put it like that. And a person who has attained that kind of perception of impermanence will attain stream entry in this life, or at least on the deathbed. But the person must further make a strong effort to understand the Dhamma in more detail and to understand dependent origination in relation to first suffering and ignorance. You must understand how ignorance actually causes you to suffer. And then you must understand that in all of the subtle parts of your experience, in all sankharas pretty much. And you must learn to uproot suffering directly and understand craving, vedana, the function of self, consciousness, and all the other words in much more detail than before. Because you must notice where there is always self involved to uproot that self. Because you need mindfulness that is strong enough to actually discern those things that must be directly seen. It is not enough to know those things intellectually. You must directly see them in your experience. Very important. And in essence, to progress, you must maintain your higher virtue and keep up your effort. Without it, it is still not going to happen. Well, it will happen at some point, but very likely not in this life, <laughs> to, to make it very clear. And then we have the right view stage. And uh, this is a work that must be done by a stream enderer. A stream enderer, first of all, knows by experience that all kinds of feelings are bad. And this is a very powerful knowledge because it stops the striving towards gaining pleasure. And a stream enderer can thus uproot suffering whenever it arises and can prevent future suffering from arising too. And he must maintain, again, his virtue to not fall back. Because you can still make the decision to go back to the lower life, as the Buddha put it. <coughs> and yeah. The stream enterer must now apply the same principles as before. Before them, and before his stream entry, he has weakened craving, but now he must uproot the craving. So he can really remove it from his existence forever. And his job is from then on to uproot sensuality and remove all the taints from his experience. And uh, the Arahantship is pretty much going beyond the taints. You must pretty much remove ignorance of the three marks from all sankharas. And now we find out what there is beyond stream entry, what there is beyond the right view. And according to the 10 fetters model, there are a certain number of things that must cease. The first three fetters fall with the stream entry, namely the belief in a stable self and anything permanent uh, that could be called a self. Then doubt, the stream enterer can no longer be touched by any kind of doubt. Doubt can still arise in his experience, but it cannot be the fundamental doubt in the Dhamma. You cannot, you can no longer be touched by the doubt. This is very important. The fundamental influence of doubt is forever removed. And then the last thing that vanishes is the attachment to virtue and duty. You are no longer attached to rites and rituals as it is often translated, but what it really means is that you have seen what Dhamma really is and no longer can follow any meditation method blindly because you have understood the fundamental things that must be done. And oftentimes the pleasure jhanas, for example, will be dropped at that point because people see, oh, okay, well, they did something, they helped me in some regard, but they are ultimately not what this is all about. And then the next stage would be that the two additional fetters, namely fetter number four and fetter number five will be weakened. And those are the fetters of sensual desire and also sensual ill will, let's put it like that. And those fetters are completely removed for the non-returner. So when you overcome sensual desire and ill will completely, then you are basically an anagami, a person who will never return to this world of form, because our world is of form and sensual desire and ill will are always directed at form, at the world of form. And all that remains are the five higher fetters. And when those are overcome too, namely the lust for material existence, lust for immaterial existence, the conceit I am or mana, restlessness or being pressured over all by feelings and ignorance of the three marks, in all things or wrong implicit assumptions, let's put it like that, then everything is pretty much done. Then you become an arahant when you have removed the slightest traces of conceit, even in the aggregate of consciousness itself, which is again very important to keep in mind. And the first three fetters are what the stream enterer has removed. And just to make very sure that you understand that, here is a short repetition because the three fetters are very misunderstood. First of all, they fall all at once. It is not that first the first fetter falls, then the second or something like that. If you have really seen through any of those fetters, you have seen through all of the fetters. 
because they all rely on the very same mechanism. They all rely on having the experience of seeing the Dhamma and understanding the experience of seeing the Dhamma. And based on that understanding, you just know, oh, all the things are happening on their own. I don't need to follow any formal meditation. Why should I? <laughs> When it's just happening on its own, why should I follow a precise instruction of steps? And he understands the difference between weakening craving and uprooting craving. And the meditator also understands that there is no external controlling self to be found in any part of his experience. And the experience is made up of the five aggregates, which is feeling, uh, form, feeling, perception, etc. You can look that up pretty much everywhere. It's one of the very popular models. And again, the meditator is also no longer influenced by doubt as he has understood how doubt just arises on its own. He has seen doubt in his nature as non-self and thus he cannot touch by it. Because when you cannot control it, why worry about it? You gained distance from doubt. And yeah, the remaining hindrances for a sotapanna or one of right view are much work, which is not central, by the way. Work is not, not something that is instant gratification, much sleep and much talk. So when he engages a lot in those things, then his progress will be limited. And he must continuously see the three marks in all parts of his experience. He must see them in all sankara. And then we have the uh, Sakadagami, which is the uh, once returner. Uh, he has overcome no new fetters, but he has weakened the pull or the grip of sensuality on him significantly. And uh, the weakening of lust and hate is pretty much what he is all was all concerned with, and it culminates in that severe weakening. And he has developed to a very good degree the perception of danger in sensuality. And this might also be kind of important, uh, that there is no clear cutoff point, as I understand it, to the stage of Sakadagami. Most of the time in the suttas, people were asking the Buddha at what stage people were. They could not, not really diagnose that themselves. And other people could also not diagnose that. It was only the Buddha who had that ability. <laughs> so uh, it is not a very uh, useful thing, in my opinion, to rely on the stage of the Sakadagami, because it's a very, it's a very vague one. It is probably the most difficult one to access. And the models of the fruition attainments are very much not in line with that, as I understand it. And there's also no real benefit in calling that you are off that stage, because the strategy that you must employ to progress further remains the same. You must uproot sensuality. <laughs> This is the goal until you become an anagami, pretty much, where you have already uprooted sensuality completely, and there is no longer any pull from sensual objects towards you. But yeah, then we have the Anagami stage, and he fully overcomes sensuality. Hence, you cannot come back to the world of the senses, by the way, because lust towards those things is forever destroyed. And he has fully seen the danger in sensuality, and could theoretically be uh, in Niroda. Uh, and Anagami can supposedly be in Niroda, namely the state of the perception of, as of the cessation of perception and feeling. So you could theoretically assess the state of anagami by that, by the attainment of Niroda. And it happens shortly before Arahantship, pretty much, and they have very little dust on their eyes remaining. But they must fully destroy the remaining taint still. The taint of sensuality has been destroyed, but there are thrill, uh, still three other taints remaining, pretty much, which is also important to keep in mind. But yeah, uh, maybe one more remark. What people nowadays practice as Niroda is not necessarily what the Buddha talked about as Niroda which is also important to keep in mind, because if you practice wrong Niroda, then you are not an Anagami, even though you had some magical experience of cessation. Again, very important to keep in mind, and it's very easy to mistake those experiences for other things. But now a short overview over the asavas or the taints, so what must actually be uprooted or removed from your experience from Suttapati to Arahantia. So the Arahant is basically a person of right view who has also destroyed the taints. And the taints are, first of all, lust for sensuality, for being, for views, and for ignorance. And we have already discussed uprooting of sensuality in the jhana uh, chapter to a big degree, but we will go through it again here in some detail to make clear what I mean. And then uh, the other taints will also be discussed in some, some detail. And the Arahant has seen the Sankara Dukkha in all parts of his experience. And through polishing his perception of these three marks, like a conch shell, he can actually make an end to suffering in this life. In essence, he sees, this is not me, I am not this, this is not for me, very important, in all parts of his experience. And that can only be seen through 
perceiving anicca through perceiving uh, dukkha, sankara, dukkha, and all things. And once all the drives are gone, right knowledge arises, and then right liberation is the result, which is arahanship in this very life. <clears throat> And now to an important observation when it comes to problems and suffering. And this is very important in my opinion. First of all, there is an observation that you can easily make, namely that you will try to fix a problem when it arises. Thus, when there is trauma in your life or difficulty in your life, you have much more incentive to practice. This is a mechanism behind the, the divine messenger events, by the way. Those make you practice because there's a reason for you to practice, a direct reason in your experience. Thus, when there is problem, when there is trauma, when there is suffering, you are much more inclined to actually practice the Dhamma. And again, the divine messenger is pretty much a, a prime example. And the Buddha even advised Sotapanna and beyond to induce such kind of thinking via contemplation and via living in harsh environments because they are uncomfortable and induce some kind of suffering. Thus, they always vividly show you what must still be done. He has not advised us to dwell in states of, of comfort, as an example. He said, sleep on a wooden board. <laughs> he said, live in the forest, live in empty huts, seclude yourself from other people, make sure that there is some difficulty and some danger in your life that is very apparent to you, so that there is always a reason for you to practice, a very direct reason in your experience. And he even scared advanced practitioners to a degree to re-arouse their energy and to refocus their efforts. Because it is possible to make stream enterers very lazy. Because there is basically no suffering left while there is still work to do. And the mind always needs an immediate problem to get to work. Otherwise it will pretty much do nothing. It has no reason to do so. Because the mind simply works like that. It needs a problem and then it tries to find a solution. And if we do not want to wait for catastrophes to happen, we should by all means try to prepare in advance and contemplate such things so that we can artificially reintroduce the sense of urgency into our life. And difficulty in that sense is a catalyst for spiritual progress. But it is also important to not overdo it and to have the right amount of difficulty in your life. Because it is possible to overdo it and it's not good to overdo it and end up in a, in a, in a madhouse. Okay, but let us now continue with the content on overcoming sensuality. Again, this is very important because sensuality is probably the biggest hindrance for all beginners. And just to remind you of the problem with sensuality or with lust, the simile that we have seen before. Suppose a man were to take a loan and undertake a business and his business were to succeed and so that he could repay all of his money, his loan, and there would still remain enough extra to maintain a wife. Then considering this, he would be glad and full of joy. So this is what overcoming lust feels like. This is what it feels like to overcome the hindrance of lust. And this is very important. It is like repaying all your debt that you have accumulated. Because whenever you engage in sensuality, you make craving stronger. And when craving is there, it is of an oppressive nature, like a loan shark who is always standing behind you and you know that he wants his money back. This is the oppressive nature of lust. And hatred is like a disease, as we have seen before. So you notice in essence that your sensual engagement is like borrowed jewelry, as the Buddha put it. You have to give them back at some point. And this will be a moment which is not nice. So we should make all kinds of efforts to really overcome sensuality and with it the oppressive nature of it. And again, a short reminder, sensuality is of a very oppressive nature and it is an all or nothing thing. Engagement with sensuality maintains ignorance. So ignorance, as we have seen, is the root cause of all of our problems, but it is also a sankara, namely a thing that is dependent on other things and thus it will change on its own. But because of that, it requires maintenance. It requires a mechanism to, to stay there. And that mechanism is engagement with sensuality. And sensuality overall makes you addicted to pleasant sense contacts. And it is basically the, the most fundamental of all addictions, the addictions to, to pleasure. <laughs> and no matter what it comes through, no matter what sensory organ is used to get that uh, to get that good feeling. All of them are pretty much the same. And overcoming sensuality means overcoming all addictions. It is all or nothing. Simply because when you accept something as pleasant, then everything else will be worse in comparison. So you always devalue everything else in comparison to the one thing that you deem more agreeable. Simply by more, by introducing a more, everything else is stepping a bit back. And all feelings essentially are bad. 
good feelings are bad when they stop bad feelings are bad while they are there and neutral neutral feelings are bad when they are not known it is a built-in feature from from feelings pretty much and overcoming sensuality requires a lot of going against the stream and it, re it requires a lot of mental strength there are stream interests that are too weak to overcome sensuality because it is a very daunting task even though uh, if you had a very strong experience of of relief by the way that does not mean that sensuality has no grip on you it still requires a lot of work and it still requires a lot of striving otherwise the buddha would not have repeated that so often manly strength manly striving effort training drilling all those things it is not something that is always pleasant it is akin to work sometimes at least but yeah here are more or less the two phases of of pleasure and i really like that picture what we can see here is either a, a vase in the middle or two faces that are about to kiss and they illustrate the nature of sensuality quite well because sensuality has a pleasant aspect at it but it also has a very unpleasant aspect namely that it is initially very painful because there is only pleasure when there is first a craving that motivates us to engage in sensuality and what we do is we only focus on one of those things namely on the pleasant component which might be in the middle and the unpleasant component the pain is always ignored by us simply by immediately acting out of our cravings and then engaging in sensuality to make that craving go away but if we cease to ignore the painful nature then the mind will over time cool down and can no longer engage in sensuality the same way as before and the buddha advised us for example in this short citation that we should see the danger the gratification and the escape in sensuality and he said in one of the suttas from the anguttara nikaya number three uh, book of the threes uh, number 103 so long monks as i did not directly know as they really are the gratification in the world as gratification the danger in the world as danger and the escape from the world as the escape i did not claim to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment but when i directly knew as it really is the gratification in the world as gratification the danger as danger and the escape from it as escape then i claimed to have awakened to the unsurpassed perfect enlightenment and then the knowledge aris uh, the knowledge and vision arose in him unshakable is my liberation of mind this is my last verse now there is no more renewal of existence so this is also very important to keep in mind you must understand the danger and when the buddha talks about the world he is talking about the world of the senses he's talking about sensuality and once you have understood where the actual gratification lies where the danger lies and what the escape is then you have understood the dhamma pretty much and this is very important so and what is the the gratification the gratification lies in the fact that sensuality engagement in sensuality makes the craving go away the gratification is actually starting on a whole different level it is not in the senses it is in your craving towards the object of the senses so the gratification is determined by that it starts within you and not within the sense objects so this is the gratification but it is also the danger because you have no say in the world of the senses they change on their own and the escape is okay to not no longer regard them as yours because you see how dangerous it is to cling to something that is completely outside of your control and when you realize that then you cannot engage in the same way as before so you should really cultivate the perception of danger because the mind automatically lets go of things that it deems as painful or not worthy of having we wrongly see the pleasure as not painful due to our ignorance we ignore the second part of the of the of the of the picture with the vase and the two faces we only focus on the pleasant aspect but completely ignore the pain and pleasure depends on the simultaneous presence of craving which is always painful and always depends on a feeling any type of craving always exists in relation to a feeling it is completely determined by it and uh, this can't be uprooted by mother wanting we have to directly see the danger the present danger in engaging in sensuality otherwise the mind will not let go of it the mind automatically lets go of all harmful things you don't have to actively let go the mind just does that as soon as a danger is seen and you have to see the danger in sensuality and not instead of you have to know it peripherally which is very important and it is as before explained in the simile of the poisonous drink it is like knowing that there is poison in your drink from now on then you can't drink it anymore and you notice that the danger is there 
you can see it for yourself. There is little gratification in comparison to the rather big danger that uh, sensuality has. And you must understand gratification, danger and escape for in, in the case of, for example, the world or feelings. It is not the problem that there are bad feelings, for example. People usually jump to that conclusion at some point or another that feelings are bad or that the objects in the world are bad. They misunderstand sensuality completely and do not see it through craving or do not see craving as the source of the problem. And the gratification is wanting feelings to not be bad or to want, it, want them to be better or wanting them to not be there or something like that. And the danger is approving of that wanting things to be different. The approval of craving, the engagement in that process. Because when you engage it, then the rest automatically follows. Engaging in one central object means that craving overall is reinforced. And when craving overall is reinforced, then the cycle of ignorance is reinforced and ignorance is strengthened. Because whenever we engage in sensuality, we cannot see the three marks. W would we see the three marks in the object we try to engage with, then we would not engage with it because we would notice it as painful, as dangerous. And then we would not do it. It is like putting our head on a chopping block and the, the, the axe could smash down at any given moment. And overall, change is a problem because change makes things that we want to be permanent uh, go away. And the escape means that we first endure the wanting and then repeatedly see the danger. And when we often see the danger, then the mind will slowly let go. Again, this is a gradual process. This is not something that happens overnight. Yeah, change overall is a problem, it is risky, and it makes our pleasure stop. But the problem is, the more we want things to be different, the more we want things to change. But fundamentally, we want our pleasures to stay eternally. We want ourselves to be forever there. We want all the things that we own to remain unchanging. Yet we approve of the process of change, of, the, uh, of changing. So we want things to, to change because we don't want them to change. This is a, a fundamental contradiction in our life. And it's very important to see it like that. So by approving of wanting more, we automatically want change. But at the same time, we want those things to change for the other state not to change, which is impossible. It's not possible to make it like that. And here's just a small illustration to uh, illustrate the entire process. There is always to the, to the left side the pain of craving present. For example, if you want to smoke or something like that. And then we have the pleasure of sensuality, which is fully determined on the presence of that craving. If we have no craving for smoking, then we would not smoke, as an example, because the entire pleasure that comes out of smoking is determined by the pain of that craving. For example, some girls, some small girls, uh, like to play with Barbie dolls. They have a craving towards Barbie dolls. And that, thus, uh, that is why they experience joy and gratification on account of playing with Barbie dolls. But when you do not have a craving for playing with Barbie dolls, then there is no gratification in the entire process for you, which is very important to keep in mind. So the only way that we get some pleasure out of engagement with sensuality is the simultaneous presence of craving. And that presence of craving is always of an oppressive nature. It is painful. It makes us act towards the objects of our senses. And if we don't do that, then that means that we feel painful feelings. And most people do not want to, uh, to feel painful feelings. And as a result, they engage in sensuality to make the painful feelings go away. And in that sense, our drives for sensuality are always rooted in the desire to get rid of the painful craving. And we must really cultivate that perception of danger, cultivate that perception of pain. Otherwise, the mind will usually ignore it because it seems easier to go in the direction of sensuality than to go in the direction of Dhamma. And in essence, it is a bit like hot, uh, touching the hot stove. So here's a small exercise that you can do to better understand the entire thing. Again, the first block should be done immediately, and then you can see the solution once you have done the, done the experiment. And the only way for a human mind to give up lust for agreeable things is to rewire the mind to perceive them as painful. Imagine touching a hot stove. Would you do it again after burning yourself? Or you can imagine, imagine anything painful that you previously deemed as, as agreeable. Like, would you ever drink tequila again after you nearly died from alcohol poisoning after drinking it? And now you can think and ponder about it for a moment. But yeah, the solution is quite clear. The human mind immediately learns not to do that painful thing again. However, it can only do that based on the experience and based on true things. Luckily, sensuality is indeed painful. We just choose to ignore it. 
and in training us to perceive craving as pain, the mind starts shying away from it automatically without having, us, uh, having to do anything. And this is amplified by jhana as you revert to a lower state of, of perception to a lower state where there is no more safety uh, by giving in to lust. And the mind will notice that over time and it will more and more deem engagement in sensuality as not worth it, which is very important. But yeah, overall, if you do that often enough, the poison of sensuality will fade, as the Buddha put it. He even phrased it as follows. He said that hate is very painful and quick to fade. Lust is slightly painful and slow to fade. And ignorance is slightly painful and also slow to fade. So as you can see, the more painful something is, the more incentive we have to fix something and the easier it is to make that thing go away. So when you are a hateful person and start practicing the Dhamma, then the hate will very likely fade quite quickly. But the lust is more deceiving of a more deceiving nature because it acts like it is well, pleasant, while it isn't in reality. So it takes more time. And ignorance takes likely even more time to completely fade away because only, only the Arahant is completely free of ignorance. And the more painful something is, the more motivated we are to overcome it. So ignorance is the subtlest of them all. And you will really have to develop jhana sufficiently to finish the job. Or you technically don't have to develop jhana, but jhana is a very good tool to, to overcome sensuality. And the Dhammapada also had something to say on the job of a Sotapanna that tries to overcome sensuality and attain full liberation. And it says, nothing is better for a holy man, and a holy man is a person who is at least a Sotapanna, than when he holds his mind back from what is endearing, to the extent the intent to harm wears away, to that extent does suffering subside. From Dhammapada number 390. So the, the more you restrain yourself as a Sotapanna or higher, the less suffering there will be. This is a way to uproot suffering for a Sotapanna. And uh, it can help to make things a bit uncomfortable for you, as I already mentioned. Suffering really can be the catalyst for progress. And in essence, to give you even more of an idea how the entire process works, how it can be that something that you regarded previously as, as pleasant can actually be painful, I want to give you a simile from... Uh, the suttas that the Buddha often gave. And he pretty much uh, gave a talk to a person who was called Magandiya. Suppose Magandiya, there was a leper with sores and blisters on his limbs, being devoured by worms, scratching the scraps of the opening of his wounds with his nails, cauterizing his body over a burning charcoal pit. Uh, so those people were lepers and lep leprosy is a skin disease with, well, your limbs are essentially falling off and uh, mm, rotting on your, on your skin. And they get some kind of relief by cauterizing their wounds with, with glowing iron rods. And the Buddha says, but when a physician would make medicine for such a leper, and by means of that medicine, the man would be cured of his leprosy and would become well and happy. Then, if two strong, strong men would come along and seize him by both his arms and drag him toward a burning charcoal pit, what would you think, Magandiya? Would that man twist his body this way and that way? that way, to try and escape with the grip of those men. And uh, the person answers, yes, Master Gotama. Why is that? Because the fire that he used to get some relief from his pain was indeed painful to the touch, hot and scorching. And what do you think, Magandiya? Is it only now that the fire is painful to the touch, hot and scorching? Or previously too was the fire painful to the touch, a touch hot and scorching? Obviously, the fire was always hot. It was always painful. And the same is true for sensuality. Sensuality was always painful. It was always forcing us to act in a certain direction. It is just that we always ignored that because we were relieving some even stronger pain with it. And thus we started to misconceive that kind of, well, pleasure that was actually painful as a relief. And thus we started uh, regarding it as something good. But once we notice that it is not, then we cannot go back, just like the person who has now no longer leprosy and is no longer suffering from something more oppressive. That person can no longer enjoy the presence of a charcoal pit that that person regarded previously as something good, as something that gives him relief. But if now a person comes in and wants to press a glowing hot iron rod on his skin, then he can no longer take any joy in it. And if you want to read the entire sutta, you can go to Majima Nikaya number 75 to get an intuition. And essentially, for a noble one who has seen all of this, pretty much all career people, people with money of, or obsessions, and people who are heavily engaged in sensuality are a bit like children playing with dirt to them. 
you have compassion with them and hope that, that they will grow out of it and find a way out of suffering. Uh, but it is very tough, uh, in my opinion, to make this not sound conceited. If you have seen that sensuality is painful and see how other people are still in engaging in it, then it's very hard not to try to convince them <laughs> that it is actually painful. But they will not see it. This is also very important to keep in mind. Just like you needed a reason to get uh, to find a way out of suffering, so they do need a reason too to overcome sensuality. And when they have no divine messenger event, then it's very unlikely that they will ever pick up the Dhamma and try to find a, a way out of suffering. You know that there is something much better, but they don't know that. They need to make those experiences themselves, and it's not too good to try and force those views on them. While there is no greater value and no greater happiness than full liberation of mind, not everyone will see it like that. It can feel quite intimidating in the beginning, to be precise. And now we would come to the last or second part of the of this lecture, uh, of this chapter, but we will stop here, as I think I have talked long enough. Next time we will talk a bit about overshooting the mark, uh, how we can go too far in one direction or the other, and what Nibbana and all those other things really are, and the various different paths that are leading us there. But this is enough for today. Now we have, as always, some time for questions and answers. So if there is anything unclear uh, during this lecture, then by all means, feel free to ask in the comments below. And please open a new comment for every question that you have, so that YouTube informs me about your question, so that other people can benefit from your questions too. Because it often happens that people have the same questions, and it is good to have an answer in the form of a video. I will answer those question, uh, questions at the end of the lecture series with a noble friend of mine, so that we can hopefully give you a satisfying answer to your questions from multiple angles, because he has a lot of knowledge when it comes to philosophy, where I might be lacking a bit, as an example. While my knowledge in philosophy mainly dates back to the computer science philosophers, like Frege and uh, Leipzig and all the others, who are not so much uh, in the mainstream of philosophy. But yeah, I guess this is pretty much it for today. If you know anyone who would benefit from such a lecture, feel free to share this lecture series with them so that you can uh, give them access to some uh, probably good Dhamma that is very much in line with what the Sutta say. But again, I want to make sure that you have to check everything I say here for yourself. You should not just take it only on faith. You can take it uh, upon faith for a time, then practice it until it becomes confirmed faith. But yeah, if you enjoy what I do here, feel free to uh, share the lecture with others. If you wish, like and subscribe to the video. But until then, I wish you a pleasant day and uh, goodbye.